are kicking off a new series called The Shadow of Death. And, you know, sometimes in this life, uh, we can certainly feel like we're walking through the shadow of death. This uh, phrase comes from Psalm 23, where David writes, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, you, God, are with me. And life can certainly feel like a shadow of death. Sometimes I feel like I'm dying because I'm so exhausted all the time. But good news, I feel pretty good this morning because my kids are with Pop Pop down in Winchester, Virginia. Yes, praise the Lord, and uh, it's been great. Uh, yesterday, Angel and I, we drove to Frederick to meet her father, uh, who our kids call Pop Pop. It's funny. Knox, even though he's just a little over a year, he knows who his Pop Pop is, and he goes, Pop Pop. And uh, when, we hear, when he hears him on the phone, he'll come over and say his name. It's pretty cool. And anyway, so we dropped off the kids in the morning, and then we came back to get ready for the wedding, and we went to the wedding, and we had uh, great plans of going on a date night. And so we were just going to have fun the entire day, go out to eat. So we went to the Cheesecake Factory, and we, uh, yes, love the Cheesecake Factory. We shared a salad, and then afterwards, we went home and didn't really realize how fast the day was going. So uh, by the time we got home, we said, you know what, we'll lay down for a little bit, and then we'll go out and we'll go to a movie and we'll just have, have a great evening. So we brought home the piece of cheesecake that Angel, Angel got um, at the Cheesecake Factory. And so we got our, you know, our jammies on, feeling pretty comfortable. And she brings the cheesecake and I'm laying in bed and she's sitting there eating it and we're just talking. And she's able you know, to eat the piece of cheesecake and she has a few bites left over. So we're like, well, you know what? Let's just nap for a little bit because what other thing do you do as parents other than nap when your kids aren't away? We fell asleep for five hours. <laughs> Angel, when we woke up, we both woke up at the same time. Angel goes, I'm like, I didn't even wake up. She goes, I only woke up long enough to eat the rest of my cheesecake, and then I went right back to sleep. <laughs> and then been sitting there. She only had two bites to go. But that's how tired we were. We got home. We put on our jammies. We laid in bed. We did the, we did the big S word, which is our favorite thing to do, sleep as parents. So, um, so anyways, feel pretty good today. I got rested up. So we woke up and we were going to watch a movie and then for some reason Comcast just wasn't working. And so I'm like, let's just go to sleep. And so we ended up, we ended up going back to sleep. But man, sometimes life, it really can run you down. Over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been looking at the armor of God and we've been talking about how Satan is our enemy, but God has given us tools to fight back against our enemy. And so he's equipped us with the armor of God, and he is scheming against us. He's lying in wait. He's plotting. He's looking for ways to destroy us, but he will not succeed. We not only have the victory in Christ, but we have the armor of God. But we really never ask ourselves this question, why does Satan scheme against us? Why does Satan attack us after all? Is it just because he wants to make us miserable? Is it because he doesn't like you as a person? He's like, I really don't like you. I think I'm going to try to see you fail. The ultimate reason why Satan wants to attack us is because he wants to alienate and cut us off from a loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. That is his number one objective. If he has a military under his control, he's got one objective, to cut you off from Jesus, to rob you of the assurance that you have and the relationship that you have and the love that you have through the victory of Jesus Christ. And so he truly is our enemy. But if we do love God, if we are not cut off from his grace, if we are assured of our salvation, we get to unlock the keys to living a life that we've never expressed or felt before. It is a life filled with joy. It is a life filled with truth. It is a life filled with ultimate happiness and ultimate purpose. And so if you are a child of God and you are assured of your salvation and you do rest under the assurance of God's love for you, you can defeat Satan and his schemes against us. And so as a person who loves God and loves people, we get to feel this idea that regardless of our performance, our looks, regardless of our insecurities or our accomplishments or our social status or any other metric that we use to drive our self-worth is swallowed up in the love of God and who he is and what he has done for us. And so Satan wants to cut you off because he doesn't want you to experience true freedom. Tim Keller wrote this, Satan doesn't control us with the fang marks of the flesh, but with the lies of the heart. God doesn't love you. You can't win this battle anyways. 
You're just a failure. You'll never measure up. You aren't really saved. And if you are really saved, God isn't happy about doing it because that's how bad of a person that you are. But Satan is our enemy, number one. But we do have another enemy, and that enemy is called death. You know, we're all familiar with villains. I think probably one of the greatest villains that I've ever read about or seen, you know, in like the fantasy world is definitely Thanos. Thanos is like the embodiment of a villain. He seeks mass chaos and destruction, even though he wants order. Uh, he thought that he could just eliminate half of the universe's population, and that would bring order and true happiness and peace. I mean, the guy was really a sick maniac. But we do know all different kinds of villains. Bane, the Joker, Lord Voldemort. I mean, we even have real-life villains that we've experienced, right? I mean, people like Mao, Stalin. Hitler. And these people are the embodiment of evil, and they seek our destruction. And that is the picture that the Bible has for our, our, our other enemy being death. Death is our enemy, and he is the worst villain at all. You know, when we, when we look at our culture and the villain of death, there's a lot of confusion about death. Our culture is somewhat obsessed with death. I mean, movies, video games, articles online, board games, the fantasy world. I mean, really, there are a lot of things that revolve around death. The majority of our teenagers are growing up playing video games and saturating their minds with not just killing people, but killing them over and over and over again in multiple different ways. There are some things that are so really corrupt. I mean, there are video games where you can just be a sniper and you travel around the city and you just kill people for fun. We watch Netflix series and TV series that are obsessed with this idea of death. And this is how messed up our culture is. Our culture says there's life on Mars because they find bacteria, but yet they look at a person in the womb and they call it nothing more than a clump of cells, and that's not life. That is a major distortion of facts and reality. That's how twisted we are with death. We spend billions and billions of dollars killing things and people. Some of these things we eat, like cows and chickens and things of that nature. But then there are other things like wars, sometimes senseless wars. And we also do spend a lot of money trying to prevent death because we don't like it and we don't want it. And it seems so unnatural. And that's because it is. Simply put, death is an event. It is the loss of life. If we look at death as a state, death is the absence of life. So when someone dies, they are separated from life. When we speak of computers that die, right, that means the motherboard has crashed, it has lost life, it, it, it's dead. When we talk about a person that has died, their soul, their spirit has left their body. And so when we understand this idea of death, the Bible actually has a lot to say about death, and it references death in three different ways, okay? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. We are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and I think that that symbolism really talks about the sufferings that we experience on this earth, but I definitely think that includes the suffering and the enemy of death. The Bible says that there are three kinds of death. The first one is spiritual. This is where the sinner is dead to God. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, you are dead, walking in your trespasses and in your sins. You're like a zombie. You're alive but you're spiritually dead. He says the same thing in Colossians chapter two. Then we've got physical death. This is when the Bible says the soul or the spirit leaves the body. And so James says in James 2, 26, the body without the spirit or without the soul is dead. And then thirdly, the most fearful one is eternal death. This is where the body and the soul exist in a state of separation from God. And the New Testament writers have tried to give a picture of what this eternal separation with God really looks like. Matthew, for instance, chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, don't fear the person who can kill the body. Fear the one who can destroy the body and soul in hell. And so it has this idea of destruction. The book of Revelation in chapter 20 and 21, it really gives this powerful imagery of what eternal death looks like. It pictures it as a, a, a lake of burning fire. And people who are separated from God and not in a relationship with him, who live a life of sin, these could be good people. They're just cut off from God, are cast into this lake of fire, and it's pictured as burning. Now, we don't know if there's a literal fire there or a spiritual fire there, or if fire really represents this horrific state of being alone and separated from God. 
But whatever this eternal state is, we know that it isn't good. We know that God isn't there. And we know that we're alone. And we know that we're in torment. I think the simple way to understand it is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, where Paul says, you are separated from God. You're separated from his power, and you're separated from his presence. Well, this morning, I'd like to give you five reasons why uh, death really is our enemy. Now, let me ask you a question. Who's responsible for our death in this life? Is it God? Is it the devil? Or is it us? Well, the Bible says that Adam and Eve are the ones who brought in death, and it goes on to say that all die because all sin. Let me give you an illustration. You know what my son's favorite phrase to repeat is? This is what he does. Okay, We have a fireplace in our room, uh, our living room that we built. And by we, I mean I, and uh, tried to. And so I built this, you know, little, little, little mantelpiece. Well, the mantle's up high. I don't, I, I don't know what this is called down here, but it's just, you know, about, yeah, thank you. Heart. And so I'm not a construction guy, okay? You guys know that. So it's about 18 inches up off the ground. You know what Knox's favorite thing to do is? To climb on it. He loves to climb on everything that we have in our house. We put our chairs, you know, on top of our table and everything. And so he gets up there and he looks at me and he's got this little Ricky smile because I'm rotten just like he is or he's rotten just like I am. And he goes, get down, get down. And the reason why he does that is because I say, Knox, get down. And then sometimes I'll stop my feet because he thinks I'm coming after him. And so he'll get down and he'll run to do whatever honorary thing he's going to try to do. But the other day, Knox got up there, and he slipped, and he fell backwards, and he hit his head. Now, whose fault was it that Knox got hurt? It was, it was his. He climbed up there. He knows better than that, even though he's one and a half. He knows better. Adam and Eve knew better. Ignorance was not an excuse. They knew better. And so here they are with God. And I tell Knox, I say, Knox, you little stinker man, you better not. And he looked at me and he did it anyways. And then he fell. And Adam and Eve, I call him stinker man. And so Piper, Piper, whenever Knox pulls her hair, does something bad, she goes, ah, daddy, daddy, Knox, little stinker man, he needs to go to a timeout. <laughs> and so she's calling him a stinker man now. It's great. I love it. And he does. He stinks. He's a little man and he stinks. He's a stinker man. And we are stinker man too, man. We look up at God and we look God right in the face and we choose to sin anyways, even though we know it is wrong. And God told Adam and Eve, when you sin, you will surely die. Let me give you five reasons why death is our enemy. First of all, death is our enemy because it is contrary to our nature. You were not created to die. That's not the purpose. That's not what you were created for. You were created to live, not die. Let me read to you Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. It says, The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, and in the east where he placed the man he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God gave to grow every tree that is pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God put Adam and Eve in a place to live, not to die. They had this tree of life. And contrary to evolutionary theory, human beings were never intended. It was not their purpose to suffer and to die the way that we experience today. And you know, there is no such thing as dying from natural causes. How did that person die? Natural causes. Death is the most unnatural thing that we could ever experience because that is not our purpose or our intention. Death is our enemy because it's not natural. The second reason why death is our enemy is because it is a result of sin. Human race dies because of Adam and Eve's sin. That's something that we inherit from Adam and Eve. And Genesis 2, 17 God said this, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in that day that you eat it, you will surely die. And so here we have that fulfillment. We die, ultimately, because of Adam and Eve's sin. It's what we've inherited. Romans puts it like this, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so death was passed to all men. Why? Because all men sin. Now, a lot of people use this verse to say that sin passed on to all men. That's not what the Bible teaches. 
There is no such thing as inherited sin. And even if that doctrine were true, let's just even say the doctrine of original sin was true. The whole point of Romans chapter 5 is to teach that we have original grace. That because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he not only dealt with the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin, but he can potentially deal with your own consequences from your own sin. His sacrifice, his death was greater than Adam's. It was not just equal to Adam's, it was greater than Adam's. The whole point of Romans 5 is victory through Christ because of his death. But death is our enemy because it is a result of sin. Paul put it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, in Adam all die. We die comes from our own sin. Number three, death is our enemy because it reigns as a foreign king who has usurped power over the entire earth. Nobody likes an invading king, right? Imagine somebody coming into your home and saying, this is my home now. These things are my things. I'm going to tell you what to do and where you're going to go. Death is pictured as this king that imposes his will on the entire earth. It's this powerful metaphor to show how powerful death really is. You know, when Paul goes on to talk about death in Romans chapter 5, he uses this word that literally means to reign as king. And so here's what he says. Death reigned as king from Adam to Moses. He even goes on to say, death has reigned as king even over little children who have not sinned. Because we have inherited Adam's death. He says, by the transgression of the one, death reigned as a king through the one. And so death is this powerful, imposing force. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I don't like people messing with my stuff. Right, really? Am I the only person that's like, hey, come on in, do whatever you want? <laughs> no, mind your own business. Don't touch my stuff. Don't mess with my stuff. Don't tell me where I can go and what I can do, right? I'm the king of my castle. This is my home, not yours. And that's how we should view our life. This is my life, death. This is not yours. I want to be in control, not you. And the gospel gives us the opportunity to do that. And so death is this tyrant that has everyone under its power. It controls how we approach life. What major decision do you make that doesn't factor in death? I mean, even minor decisions. The job that you chose, a lot of people don't choose high-risky jobs. The things that you participate in, I think you're crazy if you like to go skydiving or rock climbing. You know there are actually people who climb rocks that are really high without any straps on? That is insane to me, <laughs> partially because I have a fear of heights. But to me, I'm just like, wow, that is crazy. And they do it all the time for fun. I'm like, that isn't fun. That is torture. These people are nuts. There's no way I'd do something like that. But we make decisions all the time about death and staying alive, the food that we eat, the places that we live. Who says, man, hey, I want to go where the murder rate is high. That's where I want to go. And unfortunately, Baltimore is a very high place. I don't know anybody that is dying to get into Baltimore. And I, don't, I didn't mean that on purpose. That was just kind of like me being cool. Dying to get into Baltimore. Did you pick that up? I don't know anybody that does that. The majority of people that I know are trying to get out. Because Baltimore is turning into this place that is a war zone. And we can make a difference with the gospel and with our service and our love. But it can only come from the church, ultimately. And so death becomes this lifelong effort to avoid it or delay it. And so we've got health care and safety and exercise, and we try to preserve life as much as possible. In 2014, almost 30% of the federal budget alone tried to help our health care system. 30% of a billion, billion, trillion dollar budget. I mean, this is a lot of money. Death is our enemy. Number four, death is our enemy because it is a tool of Satan. Yes, I do believe Satan can wield the power of death. And, you know, when I was studying on this, uh, some of the theologians disagreed with this point of view because they thought that only God had the power of life and death, and he never permitted Satan to utilize death in such a way to accomplish his purposes. But I don't think that that's true. And what they would turn to is the book of Job and how God would let Job suffer in ways, but he wasn't allowed to take, Satan wasn't allowed to take his life. But Job's kids passed away. And I do attribute that to the work of Satan. And I think the Bible is pretty clear that Satan can wield the power of death by the providence and the permission of God. Hebrews puts it like this. He says, now, since the children have flesh and blood, being us, 
he being Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. The whole point of Jesus dying is to save us and destroy the power of death. The enemy, death is our enemy because it is a tool of Satan. And so Paul says that Jesus shared in our flesh and blood. He shared in our humanity. He walked like us. He was weak like us. He suffered like us. And ultimately, he died like us. And his body was subject to the same consequence that everyone in this room will eventually face, and that is physical death. Adam died, and we died. Why did he do this? Well, he did it to destroy Satan and the power of death to destroy our enemy. And it is only through the cross and the resurrection that Jesus made original sin destitute. It is only through the cross and the resurrection that Jesus destroyed spiritual death. It is only through the cross and the resurrection that Jesus put a down payment on our physical resurrection. And one day we will overcome the body of the grave. And finally, he did away with eternal punishment. This is why Jesus died, to do away with spiritual, physical, and eternal death for everyone. So while you have an enemy, you also have an advocate who's working on your behalf to destroy your enemy. Satan and his evil demons, they devote most of their energy and most of their time to lead you astray, ultimately, that you may die an eternal death of separation from God. And so for those of us who are outside of Christ, we're slaves to fear. You know one of the reasons why Western culture react so tragically to death and suffering is because our culture has adapted this naturalistic worldview where death is this great enemy, yes, but there's no purpose to it. You have no ultimate purpose. And so once you die, you simply cease to be. And so life becomes nothing more than desperately and tragically hanging on to the life that we have. But when we take a step back and we look at the gospel, we know that death can serve a purpose. We know that death is not the end. We know that the enemy does not have the final answer and the final say. We know that death can ultimately be defeated through the cross. And so while death is our enemy, death can be defeated. And then finally, death is our enemy because it is the door to final judgment. Once you die, the Bible says you enter into the dispensation of judgment. Hebrews puts it like this. And as much as is it appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. There is no second chance. There's no do-over. The decisions you make in this life impact the next one. And once you die in this life, that's it. You don't get another chance. You stand before God to be judged. And to a lot of us, that's a scary thought. That when we die... We know where we're going to spend eternity, forever and ever. We don't get a second chance. And so death is a serious enemy. Death is not something that I take lightly. I've experienced death in my own family, my own friends. And death really is tragic. And we should react to death like that. It is a tragedy. We should be angry. We should get sad. It is an invading force that has no ultimate claim on our life. But nevertheless... Death is our enemy, but it is not the end of the story. There is good news. You know Isaiah, it was written 700 years before Jesus came on the scene, and he prophesied that Jesus would be a great light in this valley of the shadow of death. And that was fulfilled in the Gospel of Matthew. Here's what it says. The people living in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. We can see again. We can experience again. We can know that there's going to be something more beyond the grave. And that brings perspective to this life. And so that's why, even though Satan has the power of death in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Paul goes on to say this in verse 15. Jesus died to free those who all lived their lives and were held in slavery by their fear of death. Do I want to die? No. Am I happy when people die? No. But despite being angry at death and hating death and not wanting death, I can live as a Christian who does not fear death. And that's why David was able to write, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
I do not fear this tool or this power of Satan and this grip that he thinks he has on humanity because God wins. And that's the essence of the gospel. We have victory through the death of Christ. And isn't that a great oxymoron? The idea that through Jesus' death, he actually overcame death. Through the ultimate tool of Satan, he was able to defeat Satan. And so death truly can become our victory. You know, death is not only our enemy, it's God's enemy. God hates death just like we do. And it was not God's intention to impose the death penalty upon humanity. But while imposing it, God was orchestrating a plan to ultimately defeat it, to ultimately undo it, to overcome it. And so this is why God became a man in the person of Jesus. If death is the ultimate villain, Jesus is the ultimate superhero. And he confronted death and he conquered death and he overcame it. And this is why he was born and this is why he died. And so here's the bottom line. Jesus has defeated the enemy death and he has the victory. And there are some of you who have experienced death and are traumatized by it and rightfully so in a lot of ways. There are some of you who will experience death either yourself or your own family. And who knows, maybe the good Lord will come back and instead of dying, we'll be changed. That's what I hope for. But we do have victory. And so that's why Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1.10, now has been manifested through the appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We can live again. Death is not the final answer. It is through the gospel that we can finally see what life is all about and what's worth living for. And so in talking about these three things called death, the first one that I want to talk about is this. If you are a Christian, spiritual death has been and is being defeated in you. You're not a dead zombie walking around. You are spiritually alive. This is what the Bible says. It says, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Jesus made us alive together with Christ, and it is by grace you have been saved. We can live again through Jesus right now. We can lay on our deathbeds and be more alive than we ever were without the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13 says this. When we are buried with Christ in baptism, he says, having been buried with Christ in baptism, in which you were also raised through him, through faith and the power of the working God who raised Jesus, him from the dead, and you, speaking to us, who were dead in your trespasses, tre trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of us of our trespasses. He's saying when you were baptized into Christ, when you obeyed the gospel, you were made alive with Jesus you're not dead anymore. You're alive. How do you know if you're alive? You know, some of us get baptized and we're just wet. There's no repentance. There's no confession. There's no belief. I mean, babies who are baptized, that's really of no consequence. There's nothing that takes place. Babies are innocent. They're pure. They inherit Adam's death, yes, but not his sin. But how do we know as Christians if we are alive? How do we know if we have conquered death? Well, here's what John has to say about that. We know that we have passed out of death to life because we love the brethren. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whose side are you on this morning? Are you on the enemy's side or are you on God's side? And you can answer that question by answering this one. Are you loving your brothers and sisters in the Lord? Do you love the brethren? Remember, love is a verb. It's an action. It's a choice. It's not an emotional feeling. And you can look at me and say, Rick, really don't like you, but I'm going to choose to love you. You can do that. The gospel gives you that permission. Do you love people? Do you love the brethren? Are you alive through the light of the gospel? We not only have the victory over spiritual death, but through Christ, we have the victory over eternal death. That is condemnation to hell. It's already been defeated for you. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, we have been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? In other words, you stand before God and God looks at you and he says, not guilty. You are not guilty for your sins. I have forgiven you. And if God has done that, he is going to save you from his wrath of eternal hell in the end. And that is good news. It is something that you can claim and own right now. 
through obeying the gospel. And so in the climax of this whole section, he says in Romans 8.1, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can stand before God right now and not have to fear death because eternal death is not something that you have to face. But it's your choice. You get to choose whether or not you will defeat death. And so there is no penalty for you. And then finally, what about physical death? Unfortunately, we do still die physically. Does that mean that death wins after all? No. Death does not win. Even if you're not a Christian, you're going to have a resurrected body. Some will resurrect for eternal condemnation. Others will resurrect for eternal life. And that decision is up to you. But there is good news in this. We will get a new body. We'll get to live again. We're not going to be floating up in heaven. Be like, hey, man, let's go over to this cloud. Let's fly. We are going to live. We're going to work and enjoy it. I know that's weird to think about, but you're actually going to enjoy the work that you do. The food that you will taste will be amazing. The fellowship that you have will be incredible. The inventions that will take place in the next life are going to be out of this world. Get it? See what I did there? Y'all didn't laugh at that, man. You make me feel like a loser when you don't laugh at my jokes. <laughs> Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. He said, behold, I tell you a great mystery. We shall not all sleep. Well, we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. We are going to be changed and it is going to be, oh, a glorious day. A new life, free of disease, free of death, free of suffering, free of evil an eternal state of happiness, and God's presence will be with us on this new earth in our resurrected body. The book of Revelation provides the imagery like this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. No more death. And neither shall be there mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Through Christ, we have the victory. And so even though death is our enemy, death does not have the final say. It is not the ultimate answer. Through Christ, we live again now and we live again then. That is the promise of the gospel. And so how should we face death as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death? And here's what I say. Feel free to hate it. Feel free to get angry at it. Feel free to be sad by it. Feel free to mourn from it, but do not fear it. Death is defeated. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you, God, thou are with me. Paul sums it up just like this. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ our Lord. Death, you're defeated. Your sting is gone. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you've had loved ones that have passed away, and you have felt the sting of death, you don't have to feel that sting. I want to encourage you this morning, if you're going through things that are leading to death, we know some of you have cancer, other of you have sickness, and some of you are just struggling in your own mind, in your own body, and you feel like you're dying daily. Death does not have the final answer. It's lots of sting. You will live again, and you get to be with those who are in Christ and who you love and who you've been around for your entire life, and you'll get to rejoice with them. And if you haven't obeyed the gospel, why wait? Why let death have the final claim and answer on your life? Why be separated from God? Why not experience the joy and the freedom of a God who loves you and who died for you and who can give you the victory through Christ? Don't let death have the final say in your life. 